Hello dear listener, thank you for tuning in. This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. And I'm your host, Chileno Diamba. Thank you for once again staying tuned to Adventist World Radio. On our program lineup today, we have wonderful items just for you. To start us off is a family life segment on the topic, Raising Teenagers, by Sister Maureen Kwamboka. Later on in the show, Brother Steve Rundu will come in with the topic, Choosing Our Own Altars. So stay put for these wonderful items which are coming right away. For now, here's a sweet music to bless you. start complaining about how their children have changed when they are at their teens. Why is this? This is usually a transition from childhood to adulthood. When children reach that their teenage, they usually have a lot in their mind, therefore making some of them become uncontrollable. Let us give way to Sister Maureen Kwamboka to talk on raising teenagers. Get enlightened.
What's a parent to do? Ask Gordon McLean as he offers help in solving crisis problems of today's young people. Roger Dudley called his book, When Teenagers Cry Help, How to Really Love Your Teenager is another popular title. Is there something wrong that you need all these books? Mom and Dad, what do you expect of your children? Sometimes you may even ask what you did to deserve what you're getting. Maybe your children are asking why they have to put up with you. A humbling thought, but it's possible. The increasing army of homeless youngsters points to something desperately wrong. McLean leads nine basic needs of children. Love, esteem, control, knowledge, ability, health, both physical and emotional, material security, moral standards, and spiritual direction. The list does not change very much as we get older. How well we supply this in the early years helps to decide how the teen years will be. The pressure is on our children. Some of it comes through parents, spoken messages and spoken messages. Do well in school, make good grades, live up to the family standards or even live down to the standards. Don't try to be better than your parents. Have we a right to tell our children what career they should have? to try to bend them against their will and aptitudes towards some occupation to fulfill our ambition. Encourage, don't drive, work with the grain. It can be hard to take school seriously when the chances of employment seem poor. The unskilled labor market is shrinking. Don't be left out. School may be tough, but so is life. Only the future will tell how far and how high our children will fly. I was not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, said Amos, but the Lord took me. Did Dad say, get back to the ship? God had other plans. We all have an image of ourselves. It is not something thought out, but felt. It was picked up from parents, teachers, brothers and sisters, peers perhaps influenced by genes. Mephibosheth was a cripple, dropped by his nurse. As she tried to carry him to safety, his father had killed himself after losing a battle. David, the new king, had hunted down and killed all Mephibosheth relations. Now David had sent for Mephibosheth. He was carried in, or made his own painful way. Why do you bother with a dead dog like me? That was Mephibosheth thought of himself, his self-image. David gave him status and dignity. He muttered, even though David gained no benefit, except satisfaction, that was enough. Are our children fulfilling our prophecies? As parents, we may not have separated behavior from the person. What you are doing is stupid, but you are not stupid. That is positive. We may have even said, mommy or daddy doesn't love you when you are naughty. It's getting late to tell our children the facts of life when the hormones are racing and the basics have been learned in the school playground. Parents should be able to pass on information about sex, but some feel tongue-tied. At least they can answer questions honestly at the level they are asked. There are Christian books on the subject. Attitudes, open or ashamed, dirty, unmentionable, from God the Father, or from the old Adam, caught more than thought, and caught early. It is good for parents to have high standards. Essential they live by those standards and are open when they slip up. Parents may hope their children live by those standards, but not stop loving if they don't. Standards and beliefs have to be adapted by young people as their own. Sometimes they buy our values, sometimes they don't. God gave ten commandments. Number eleven was invented elsewhere. Those shall not get caught. It follows easily from father to son. Cheating is cheating whether done by a child, young person or adult. Parents act a lie if they watch so-called adult films and videos and are indignant when there are pornographic magazines under the sun's mattress, like father, like son. Most small children find that work is fun. They don't know the difference between work and play. They soon learn. How much we show appreciation for what the little child can do helps to decide how the adolescent will react to being given jobs to do. If you give no work, we send out the signal, we can manage without you, you are not essential. We suggest that home is a lodging house where children live free and have no responsibilities. Leave everything to mom and dad. Of course, they may do some of the 
jobs better, but the young people can learn if given encouragement. Listen. Father, get that loan cut. How many times do I have to tell you and don't have to do a job? Last time it looked a mess. Son, you expect me to say please when I want something done. Father, get on with the job and no leap. Son, but, Dad, I only wanted to. Father, shut up and get on with it. Do you hear? Son, mutters angrily. Father, yes, I heard that. You don't go out tonight and forget the weekend camp. I'll teach you. Yes, you will, but what a lesson. How differently the dialogue might have gone. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not quick to take offense. The old bull has ruled the herd for years. Stronger, dominant, the natural boss bull. But challenges are coming. The younger bulls are getting ready to challenge. And one day it happens. The old bull is no longer the strongest, the wisest, the accepted leader. Dad, one day your little son will be able to look you straight in the eye. And soon he may be taller. It's been fun wrestling. But there comes a time when son can wrestle dad to the ground. Physical strength. I taught him tennis. Now he beats me every time. New assertiveness. Son seems to prefer his friend's company to his dad's. Different music. Different interests. Have we lost our boy? Dad, what is your self-image? Feeling a little frail? Children come home with homework parents can't understand. Wasn't invented in their time. Children soon become machine and gadget toys. Mama's kept her looks and is used to... The occasional wolf whistle from the building site workers. One day as she walks with her teenager daughter, she realizes the whistles are for the girl, not her. Move over, mom. Parents offer the roots of a secure home and all the items listed at the beginning. Love, esteem, control, knowledge, ability, health, both physical and emotional. Material security, as much as possible in difficult times. Moral standards. Together with Roots, we have been training our children to fly. We have given them wings by teaching them self-reliance, getting in responsible decision-making in helping to choose clothes, handle money accountably. What is spent is spent, and there is no more until next payday. In the book Education, Ellen G. White suggests that school rules should be few, well-chosen and enforced. She adds that, as far as possible, all those affected by rules should have hand in writing them. Some families have a regular family council where everyone may make a suggestion and not be laughed at or put down. If the family can needs replacing, why not discuss this at family council, affordable price, type, make, model, and color? If everyone has had, had a hand in choosing, then it's our car, the family car, not just dad's private possession. Discussion skill and decision skills have been learned in the process. The rules of the council help us to respect each other. Most parents can learn from the piercing common sense of their children. If they are courteous enough to listen, children see things from new angles. Boys and girls need the basic survival techniques of cooking, washing and mending, and simple household repairs. Parents need a lot of patience as they teach their unskilled junior partners. Paul expressed it, never drive or overcorrect your children or you'll make them feel frustrated, exasperated, and resentful. The teenager may not always want to work alongside mom or dad, but if the foundations have been well laid, the partnership may be renewed later. Mom and dad may be called to help fix up the first car or first house of the newly independent young person. By that time, the young people may have skills greater than their parents. That's progress. Be thankful. Teenage storms and stress will come sooner or later. It is part of the young person identity formation as they stand on their own feet. It's a painful process very often as two generations adjust to new roles. How well they survive depends on what happened in childhood. The storm bends and sways the top branches, but it's the roots that count. Hold on, parents. Things will get better. Hold on, teenagers. Lots of parents have become more understandable after a few years. Thank you for listening. I've been Maureen Kwamboka.
Dear parents, you are now in the know. Raise your children well and they'll be grateful to you in the future. This is Adventist World Radio if you've just tuned into the New Life program. And I'm your presenter, Tileno Diambo. To participate on this program, send us your comments and thoughts to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Or on our email address, which is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. at one point in life made the wrong choices and we feel bad about it. But the big question is, who do you consult on making choices? Is it God, friends, brother or sister? Here is Brother Steve to talk about choosing our own altars. Be blessed.
choosing our own altars. Our key text this day comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, reading from verse 13 and 14. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, and there observe everything I command you. Preach and author Oswald Chambers offers new covenant insight on an Old Testament text we might otherwise pass over. Unusual theme, but this Old Testament ritual, which refers to the people of God having too many shrines, has a lesson of penetrating importance for us in the New Testament dispensation. Natural devotion chooses its own altars, its own setting, and the scene of its own martyrdom. It will be very entrancing if a human being could go to a martyrdom in such moods having arranged the spectators and the scenery to suit his own ambition. But this Old Testament passage says that God chooses the place for the offering. This ends at the very root of the whole matter. We do not concentrate our gifts to God. They are not ours to have. We consecrate ourselves to God. That is, we give up the right to ourselves, to Him. All through the prophets, one hears the continual cry that the people have fasted or feasted for their own pleasure. They have been religious because it suited them, but the only devotion which is acceptable to God is the devotion on the part of regenerate soul that starts from a full-hearted consecration, which by binding the sacrifice of itself to the altar of God, receives from God the supreme sanctification which identifies it forever with the life of the Lord. The place of this devotion can never be discovered by human intelligence or natural spirituality, but only by the Spirit of God. It must be borne in mind that the burnt offering is not the sin offering. The Apostle Paul shows us distinctly the place of the altar and the sacrifice God wants. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Literally, give up your right to yourself. That people find it extremely difficult to get to this place is true, and the reason is not difficult to find. We choose our own altars and say, yes, we will devote ourselves to the foreign field, or we will give ourselves to slum work, to work in some orphanage or to rescue work. All this commends itself thoroughly to the natural heart of a man, but it is not the place the Lord chooses. The place is discernible only by the Holy Spirit, and the offering is prompted not by devotion to duty or devotion to a doctrine, but by devotion to a divine being. When our Lord talked to the woman of Samaria, he pointed out that both Jews and Samaritans had begun to worship a place instead of God. But he said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In what ways, dear listener, do you choose your own altar? Can God still use people who are serving somewhere of their own choosing? How can you discern where God is asking you to make your sacrifice? Let us pray all that God our Father will show us how we can serve Him best and how we can choose the altar that He seeks us to choose. I want to follow his leading so that I can be used by him to depend on him and to worship him in truth and spirit. Let us pray that we can be able to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to us in choosing the right sacrifice and the right place to worship God. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, we ask you to guide us through your Holy Spirit in choosing the right place to worship you and the right way of worshiping you, Lord. We know that worship is a reaction to stewardship, O Lord. Father, make us good stewards of worship. Lord, we thank you even for the guidance that you've given us, Lord, and we ask you, Father, to continue filling us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Teach us how to worship you, Lord, and give us the humility that and reverence that is needed in worship. Show us the true altar, Lord. And show us the true sacrifice, for you have prayed, trusting and believing in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The 
that marks the end of our today's program. I believe you have been blessed. Remember to send us your comments and thoughts to the producer, Adventist World Radio, PO Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Or on our email address, awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. On behalf of the producer and the entire New Life production crew, we say thank you and be blessed. I have been your host, Tileno Diambu.